Okay, so in this video, I'm going to show you how to deal with objects that are moving in a circular motion. And so just, just to see this video here, this is, uh, this is a traffic circle, and I record this with my drone, so I kind of like that. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, the first thing is the momentum principle. So we have this as the momentum principle. It says that the total force on an object, the net vector force, is equal to the rate of change of momentum. So I can write that as delta P over delta T uh, for some short time interval. And in this case, P would be the momentum, and we can write that as the product of mass and velocity. So that's the momentum principle. Now, if I want to put in the mass times velocity for the momentum, I can factor out the mass, assuming the mass doesn't change, which normally the mass doesn't change, and I get the net force is equal to M times dV dt, or the chain delta V delta T, and I can define the acceleration vector as the change in velocity with respect to time, or the derivative of velocity with respect to time. You can do it either way, and I get to this. This F net equals MA is essentially the same thing as the momentum principle, but allows us to deal, so right there, same thing, but it allows us to, instead of dealing with changes in momentum, I could deal with accelerations instead. Uh, this is Newton's second law. Um, th there's nothing important about that except that you may have already seen that, so I wanted to say that. So let's get started with a car moving in a circle. Again, this is me. That's me in the truck. You can wave me right there. Driving in a circle. And I want to find an expression for the acceleration of an object moving in a circle with a constant speed. So if we look at the car at some particular point, say right here, it has a velocity v1. A short time interval later, it's right there, and it has a velocity v2. Now those two vectors, the magnitude of those two vectors is the same, but they're in different directions. So since the direction, since v1 is not equal to v2, as a vector because it's a different direction, it did indeed accelerate. But we want to find an expression for the magnitude of that acceleration. So let me start with a different picture just so it's a little bit simpler. I replace the car with a dot. So here's the dot moving in a circle. And a little bit time later, it's right there. And it has moved an angle delta theta. And the radius of the circle is r. So I have v1 and then v2, and I want to find the change in velocity, because remember, the, the acceleration is the change in velocity divided by the change in time. So if I move these two vectors over to the side, I can see v1, v2, and I want to get with the angle theta between them, and I want to get the change in theta, v2 minus v1. So when we have two vectors that start at the same location right here, delta the delta vector, the change in vector, would be from the end of the first vector to the end of the second vector, and it would look like this. So delta v is that way. And right now, you can see if I move that vector over to the circle, that's pointing towards the center of the circle. So the change in velocity, if you're moving in a circle, the vector change in velocity direction is towards the center of that circle. Now, I want to calculate the magnitude of the acceleration not the vector, just the magnitude. So the magnitude of the acceleration is the change in the velocity, the magnitude of the change in velocity divided by the change in time. It's not the change in the magnitude of velocity, right? Because the, velo the magnitude of the velocity is constant. So that wouldn't work. So it's, you have to take the change in velocity and then find the magnitude of it. But we're going to deal with that delta v. I'm just going to write it as a scalar value. And I can write the magnitude of delta v as the magnitude of v1 times delta theta. Imagine this is a little arc length, right? I have these two vectors, v1 and v2, with an angle theta between, delta theta between them. And if they're really close together, then the arc length between v1 and v2 is the same as delta v, the straight line between those two. So this is, if the smaller delta theta gets, the better this becomes as a true statement. And in fact, I don't even need to write V1 because V1 is the same as V2, the magnitudes. So I could just write it as V. Now I can define the angular velocity as the change in theta over the change in time, delta theta over delta T. And if you have an object moving with an angular velocity through a circle of radius r, this you could also write this as the magnitude of the velocity divided by the radius. I didn't really show that derivation here, um, but we can talk about that later. So that's the true too. Okay, so now let's write an expression for the acceleration. A 
is, and I've left off the magnitude just to be simpler, uh, delta V over delta T, but I know delta V is V delta theta. And then I know delta theta over delta T is V over R. So I get V squared over R. So that's my magnitude of the acceleration for an object moving in a circle with a constant speed. That's the magnitude. The direction is towards the center of that circle. So we call this centripetal acceleration, where centripe means center and pedal means pointing. Okay, I don't know if that. that's close enough. It's center pointing acceleration. Uh, and so here again, that's me in the car. I just took a whole bunch of pictures and put them together. Uh, the magnitude of this acceleration depends on the magnitude of the velocity, and it depends on the radius of the circle. So a greater velocity, such as v squared, increases the acceleration. A greater radius decreases the acceleration. And the direction of the acceleration is toward the center, but we don't write that all the time because in Cartesian coordinates, it's hard. Because as the car moves around, it could be in the negative x direction, and then the negative y direction, and the positive x direction. It changes direction. So we, we don't there is a way to write that, but it gets a little bit more complicated. So, but in general, we'd write the acceleration as v squared over r, and that, if you want to put it in the momentum principle, you could write it as m, the net force acting on the object would have to be m v squared over r, or you could write that as p v over r. Some, some people do it that way too. Okay, what about non-circular motion? Uh, not a circle, but still changing direction. So here's the path of an object uh, moving around the sun, not to scale. And so at some instant, it's right here. And it has a momentum P1 in the direction of motion. That little dotted line is the path. And F is pointing towards, it's, it's an object orbiting a star. So F is pointed towards a star. So what does that F do? Because this is not a circle. So the force is going to do two things. It's going to, one, increase the magnitude of the momentum. And two, it's going to turn the object. So we can break this force into two pieces. So let me just, I have actually, here it is a little bit later. There's the force P, uh, F is bigger and it's pointing towards the sun and P2 is longer in a different direction. And then it starts moving away and forces is this way. So let's think about uh, the forces at P1. So here's P1 and I have these two axes. I have p hat is the direction of the momentum and then have a direction perpendicular to that. So I can take that force and break it into a component that's perpendicular to the momentum and one that's parallel to the momentum. Any right coordinate system I can break it into components. And so the perpendicular component of the force does what? It changes the direction of the momentum. So I know that the perpendicular force has to be mv squared over r. That changes the direction. Now, the parallel component of force changes the magnitude of the momentum. And here you see I have delta magnitude p, not magnitude of delta p, right? Because the force in the direction of the momentum changes the magnitude of the momentum. So if we go back up here to 1, the force is partly pushing in the direction of the momentum, so it makes it increase the momentum. It speeds up, but it also turns it. And in at uh, position 2, the force is perpendicular to the moment, momentum, so it's just turning it. It's purely circular motion. And then at position three, the force is, is again turning it somewhat, but also pushing in the opposite direction of the momentum, so it's slowing it down. Okay, so this idea of thinking about this as circular motion, we can still do that. We can still use the ideas, uh, even though it's not a circle. But what if it is a circle? So here's an example of an object orbiting the Earth. Let's look at the International Space Station. Oh, I, I didn't I didn't animate these. I'm sorry. I should have done these one at a time. Uh, so this is the Earth of radius r, and the this, the space station is orbiting a, an altitude h above that. So that's just the way we 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 write it usually. So the gravitational force on the spacecraft has a magnitude of g times the mass of the Earth, where g is a gravitational constant times the mass of the spacecraft or the, the uh, space station divided by the distance between the centers of these two squared. So in this case, the center of the, these two, the r, would be a big R plus h. Now what does that, but here's the cool thing. The gravitational force is always pointing towards the center of the circle. And that is what we need in order to have an acceleration towards the center of the circle. So I know that the net force should be, if it's moving in a circle, should be mv squared over r. So I can set 
those two equal to each other, I get the gravitational force equal to mv squared over r, and I get, uh, then I can just solve. See, the first thing you'll notice is that the, the masses cancel. The little m, the mass of the satellite, the, the space station, cancels. Uh, I also get one of the r's to cancel, and then I just need to take the square root of v, and I get uh, v squared, and I get v is the square root of g times the mass of the Earth divided by the r, but r is r plus h, and there you go. Okay, so let's calculate that just for fun. So here is actually a picture. I don't know if that's actually a picture of the real space station because it had to be taken by a spacecraft approaching it, but let's just say it is. I, I put this in uh, Python just because that's what I like to do. So there I have g, the gravitational constant, the radius of the Earth in meters, the mass of the Earth in kilograms, the altitude of the space station is 408 kilometers. So I turned that into meters. And then in line 8, I calculate the velocity. I just plug in my values. And then I print it, and I get 7,665 meters per second. And just for fun, if I take the distance around the Earth would be 2 pi r, and I divide that by the speed, I get the time. So here, and I converted it to minutes, and you get 92 minutes. So it takes 92 minutes for the space station to go around the Earth. It's going really fast. Okay. What about this? What, we talk about centripetal acceleration, and you want to talk about centrifugal acceleration. I get that. Okay, so here is the, the momentum principle. It says the net force is equal to the change in momentum divided by the change in time. That's cool. Okay, and that's center pointing centripetal acceleration is the acceleration for that, we could call a centripetal force any force that makes an object move in a circle. Centrifugal literally means center fleeing force. And it's there in order to deal with a, an accelerating reference frame. So if we think about the momentum principle, F net equals delta P over delta T, that only works if we have a non-accelerating reference frame. If you're the where you're measuring velocity from and the force is in is a non-accelerating frame. So the Earth is technically not accelerating. I mean, not it is accelerating because it's moving around the sun and it's spinning, but it's pretty close to being at rest. Okay. So, but if it, if you if you're not at rest and you have a real accelerating frame, how do you deal with that? And the answer is fake forces. Okay, so suppose I'm inside the car because I actually was inside the car because that's me driving. Uh, and I look at a mass hanging from the mirror right there. And you'll notice that in my reference frame, the mass swings to the side. And if I'm thinking about what forces are acting on that, I have the downward pulling gravitational force and the upward pulling tension at an angle, then, then it shouldn't be at rest. It shouldn't just hang to the side. I need some other force pushing to the side, and that's this fake force. So a fake force is what I add to an accelerating reference frame so that the momentum principle works again. That's what that is. And that is centrifugal force. Centrifugal force is the fake force that I need to add to a system that has an accelerating reference frame so that the momentum principle works again. And that's all I'm going to say about it. Okay, because we don't normally deal with accelerating reference frames in introductory physics because it gets a little complicated. So you can talk about centrifugal force if you want, but please don't use it right away. We'll save that for later case, later classes when it becomes more complicated. But I, I want to, I want you're old enough to handle the truth, right? You're grown up, so I want to tell you the difference between centripetal and centrifugal force. But really, the main goal was how do you calculate the acceleration for an object moving in a circle? And I'll end there. I'll see you guys later.